Welcome to Hotel Designs Live, sponsored by Technological Innovations Group in association with Crestron. We're back by popular demand following the launch of Hotel Designs Live back in June. This event, this concept, if you like, really has been created in order to keep the industry connected and the conversation flowing during and after the COVID-19 crisis. It's our way to position under the spotlight the, what we believe are the most relevant and most engaging topics happening on the international hotel design scene. It's also our opportunity to gain access, albeit virtually, inside the hotels and design and architect studios across the globe. So here's what's coming up in today's programme. In just a few moments time, we will be discussing sustainability with the sustainability legend, Bill Bensley. Then at 11 a.m. we'll be discussing adding personality in public areas. Then at 12.30 p.m. we'll be looking at reassuring the post-corona consumer. And then finally at 2 p.m. we'll be looking at the revival of smart technology in the post-pandemic world, whereby we travelled to a completely contactless hotel experience ahead of Hotel Designs Live in order to understand what technology's role will be post-pandemic. So you don't want to miss that. In addition to the live interviews and panel discussions, we also have structured product watch pitches around each session. These are 10 minutes long and they essentially allow you to understand what the latest products and innovations are, given that we're not currently um, going to trade events at the moment. So it's our way of really giving a nod to the suppliers and understanding what's launching within those areas. Please note that Katie Phillips, our publisher, is now sharing all the links to all the sessions. So you don't need to go through um, laborious um, forms you just need to enter your name and email address on the links that are provided so you can have access to all the sessions and that should be in the chat below please also note that that chat is your area to um to, to talk to us really and and send any questions but also um just to to get to know us really so you may notice that our backdrop has changed from last time. We're broadcasting Hotel Designs live from the comfort and safety of Technological Innovations Group, our headline partner. And we're here at their Experience Centre in London. If you want to book a tour at the Experience Centre, you can do so by heading over to their website and booking a tour and speaking to their team there. We also have a much more sophisticated production team, and that's all thanks to Cube Video. Over the last few days, if you've been watching our social media, you'll see that we are filming a lot of hotel reviews now and including um, videos within them, and that's all thanks to Cube Video. So if you want any more information about how they can create a video for your brand, then head over to their website, just type into Google Cube Video and it will appear. So we are moments away from going live with Bill Bensley for our first session here at Hotel Designs Live. But before we do, we want to ensure that you knew all about our annual award ceremony that takes place next month virtually. The Britlist Awards 2020 is known as the industry's most widespread search to identify the leading designers, architects, hoteliers, and suppliers operating in Britain. The event takes place on the November the 12th at 2 p.m. It is virtual this year for obvious reasons, and you can join in the audience by heading over to the website, hoteldesigns.net, click on the events tab and scroll down to the Britlist Awards, or Katie Phillips is now sharing in the, um, in the chat the, the link to um, the Britlist Awards where you can um, register your place virtually. Please also note that we're not doing a, um, a physical awards this year, but we are having a Britlist winners party and that will take place on uh, April the 29th in Minotti London showroom. Um, so we can't wait to see you all in person again. But we're going to start with our product watch pitch. So if you don't mind, David, are you ready to go with your product watch pitch? Uh, morning, everybody. Starlight Group, uh, as Hamish just mentioned a little earlier, is the home of the most trusted sleep brands in the bed industry. Uh, we've been providing sleep solutions for hospitality for, for, for quite some time now, for a number of decades, via our license agreements, such as people like Serta, which is one of the world's leading hospitality sleep providers, as well as our more recognisable brands, Satellite Beds and Rest Assured. And if you flick over onto the next slide, whoever's controlling those slides, uh, you'll get a snapshot of our values and attributes. Uh, but today, really, I want to draw your attention to the one that's in the middle, uh, the one that says a strong ethos of sustainability, as it's of particular relevance to today's session, uh, and our products are indeed manufactured in a trusted and sustainable manner. So if you flick onto the next slide, I can just let, start talking about the fact that as a, as a bed industry leader, we're dedicated to having a, a positive impact on our planet 
uh, and changing the environment and the lives around us for the better. Uh, sustainability has been in our thoughts as a business for quite some time. We were the first bed company to be accredited under the Furniture Industry Sustainability Programme, also known as FISP, which aims to improve the furniture industry's sustainability credentials. From this, our passion has grown so that sustainability is always <coughs> important to everything that we do, whether it's new product development, manufacturing efficiency, or minimising company travel miles. Looking after the planet is the responsibility for all of us, and we're proud to try and play our part in doing that. Uh, as you probably know, beds and mattresses are big and bulky items that can actually be very resource hungry. Whilst we have a responsibility to give our clients and customers a great sleep experience, we also need to ensure that we're doing so in a way that our children can enjoy our planet long after we are gone. It's very easy to compromise on fillings when it comes to making a mattress. When those sort of fillings can mislead the end user or indeed have a hugely negative impact on our environment. Uh, we don't want to do either of those things, which is why we're very proud of our vision to be home of the most trusted sleep brands so that our customers can be safe in the knowledge that we are responsible in everything that we do. Uh, from a new product development point of view, sustainability has really driven some in innovative thinking during lockdown and we're, we're looking forward to launching those products uh, in 2021. So uh, watch this space. Uh, and that's it from me. So thank you, Hamish, and back over to yourself. Thank you very much, David. And now, Alex from Harrison Harris. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Alexander Harris, the Creative Director of Harrison Harris. We are an environmentally and socially responsible interior and product design studio. Our clients include designers such as Conran, Finchatton, and Russell Sage Studio, hospitality brands such as Soho House, Four Seasons, and The Hoxton, as well as many private individuals. We have three sides to our business, interior design, bespoke service and our product collection. Our product collection comprises over 100 unique designs of furniture, lighting and outdoor furniture and accessories. All pieces are designed in-house and influenced by our European and Asian heritage, together with our love of modernism, art deco and mid-century design. We strive to be environmentally and socially responsible wherever we can and each of our designs include as many of, our of the following responsible factors we have established as possible. So for every sale from our collection, they contribute to the Designs for Life Foundation, which donates to charities, providing for those about food, water and shelter. We manufacture most of our products in the UK, reducing our transport energy and supporting local industry and communities. Most of our seating range has natural upholstery option, using sustainable and healthy materials such as coconut fibre, natural latex and wool. Many of the products have been made with recycled materials, such as 100% recycled waste glass for our Pran and Montpellier tabletops. Um, and most of our products include renewable and natural materials such as ash, bamboo and clay, and all of our timber is sourced from sustainably certified forests. Our lighting is supplied with low energy and highly efficient LED bulbs throughout, and we are passionately against the throwaway culture, and therefore our products are designed for longevity, durability, and built by skilled craftsmen using premium materials. Lastly, many of our products are easily disassembled, to be recycled, biodegraded or reused at the end of their life. Okay. Okay, thank you for listening yeah. and uh, please visit our website harrisharrislondon.co.uk for more information. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. And just to let everyone know, Bill is back online. I think I was meant to be hidden in my other camera um, into the audience, but unfortunately, but Bill's uh, named himself Hamish Kilburn, so it was a bit of a confusion. <laughs> Um, so now, just to finish off our product watch pitch, we're going to see um, a video from Schluter. But just before we do, do you want to introduce yourself, Schluter? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, my name is uh, Tony Taylor Sheriff, and I'm one of the technical specification consultants in London and the surrounding counties. Um, I think Hamish is now going to play uh, a film that we've actually um, put online. It's uh, far easier. Yeah. But just to play that then me to keep waffling on so if you Thank need to you, speak Tony. please contact us in the chat room and we can play that film
Let me introduce you first, Phil. Let's start this all over again. You're known affectionately as the Willy Wonka in, in design. You're a dedicated eco-warrior and a highly qualified jack of all trades. You've also got some concepts on the boards like the human zoo, which I really want to discuss with you, with you later on. But what I was trying to say in my first question is, during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis, global daily emissions actually fell when, from a CO2 perspective by 17%. When you talk, when you look at the industry and you know how fast technology is going, but also how greedy some industries can be, and you know sustainability has been an issue for a long, a long, long while. Um, but do you, do you feel as if COVID nineteen almost acted as that, sending us all to our rooms to think about what we've done to the planet? I, I, I do, <laughs> in a way. Now that you you said that, I, I do in a way. I think it's all. It's all brought us back to our room. That's a good way of putting it. And yeah, it's all important <laughs> to understand uh, that we're, you know, we, because we're all afflicted, we all might be afflicted by the same thing. First time, well, in, in many, many, many hundreds of years anyways. So I, I think that's in, in a, that's the silver lining of COVID for sure. That, and and I, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I love this COVID period. I think that this is the best thing that's happened in, in, in my career and the, well, the last 20 years anyways, because it's given us the time. It's that time to really focus and the time to design. And it's a time where I'm not, you know, stepping on a plane every third day as, as I used to. Um, yeah. And, and it's also taught us, I know this is one of your other questions too, but it's also taught us that, that you don't have to, you don't have to be face to face to share information. And this period of where we're all trying to reorganize ourselves and come together by Zoom meetings and, and, I, and these podcasts and so forth, I've never shared more information in my entire life life in these last nine months and I've never learned more from other professionals than I have in this last nine months. So huge, huge silver lining. So cheer up. <laughs> totally, totally. And what, what sort of conversations are you having around sustainability? Because I know that it is, is such a core part of your being, not just uh, how you work as a designer, but, but what are you seeing now that you're sort of, sort of maybe impressing you going forward? I mean, we've, we've gone through those areas of biophilic design and obviously sustainability shouldn't be something we should really be discussing, I don't think. I think it should just become naturally. But what conversations are you having at the moment that are really taking um, this topic and, and how we can really offer solutions to the next level? Well, um, I, I want to share with you a conversation that I had with a developer in uh, Jakarta yesterday. Okay. And um, I've been trying to do this, this project, particular project for the last five years. And I've been floating it. I've probably floated it, this idea seven times. And yesterday I got a resounding, yes, let's do it. And the thing is, the project that we're doing is I want to make the world's first 100% recycled hotel. So nothing in the entire hotel is, is new. Everything, including, including what we're sleeping on, everything is all, is all secondhand, pre-loved. Um, uh, the building materials, because there's plenty of building materials in Jakarta that we can use, and I'm going to use some old fishing boats, um, the old old wooden houses that from around Jakarta areas and put them together, put them together new ways. Lots of beautiful old furniture, but I, I can do this. I'm so excited that someone's finally said, yes, let's do it. Why do you think it's taken so long? Seven years you're trying to have that conversation to have a, a sustainable and recyclable hotel. Well, most of, the, most of the pushback I get was like, oh, I don't, want to, I don't want to sleep where someone else has slept. Well, you know, there's hotels that have been open for 30 years and you're sleeping in a bed that's been slept in for the last 30 years by hundreds of, hundreds of people. So what the hell's the difference? 
Yeah, definitely. And there's definitely a preconception as well. And there's, there's definitely a stigma, I think, you know, people, um, the consumers, I think, I, I think less designers, but um, consumers certainly think, you know, maybe sustainable products aren't going to last as long or durable. And especially in this current scenario, hygiene creeps up on the agenda further than sustainability has been able to stay there. Um, that's a shame, isn't it? Why can't you have both? Why can't you have a hygienic area that's also sustainable? And of course, the I mean, yeah, disposed yeah. Of? yeah, I don't see why why one subject should be pushing the other out. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it doesn't make more about this project then. So tell us more about this concept. So, everything is going to be recyclable. So everything's going to be. Um, specified from region, that, that region, I, I, I imagine. You say fishing nets, right. where, where are the fishing nets going? No, the fishing boats. Fishing boats, sorry. Yeah, um, in Jakarta, there is a, uh, how to say, a dockyard. And it's, it's, some, it's some place that both in Jakarta and in Surabaya, there are dockyards where uh, boats come to die. <laughs> <laughs> And these are old wooden boats, and then now because the fleets are all going back to, to iron, or going to iron and so forth, but they uh, uh, so they they're brought there to die and to be disassembled and to be reused and so forth. So my idea is to take um, several of these as only a part of the hotel, but take several of these and to anchor them within this um, mangrove. Uh, this natural mangrove uh, swampy area that we have on the at north uh, north part of uh, Jakarta, mm -hmm. and to create create walkways over the mangroves and so so forth, so that people understand too about the 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 micro the ecosystem of the mangroves. I think that's an important part, but also then to be able to spend a night on this boat that was an old fishing boat with but with a Bensley interior. I think it should be quite jolly. Uh, the other parts is that, I don't know if you know, but I have had an office in Bali, a design office in Bali since 19, um, 1990. And many of the uh, towns, the villages in the North Bali are being torn down now. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, say, wooden buildings that are quite, quite unique and, and very beautiful, but they're being torn down. To, and then sold for scrap and you know the, the wood gets made into into pallets and so forth so the the idea is to to buy those houses as as a as a, as a whole and then to reassemble them onto onto the land and then to put them all together uh, and, and make a, a proper a proper hotel room out of that wow so ideas like that come from you traveling to the areas. Do you, and you mentioned earlier that you think that more meetings can be done um, via Zoom and via technology um, and not face to face. Do you, do you not think that you wouldn't be able to have that inspiration that you've, you've obviously had without actually traveling to the area and seeing this for yourself with your own eyes? Right. So I, what my question was, um, you- your, your volume is really, your volume is really down too low. Oh, geez. Can you hear me now? Just barely. Just, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Okay, perfect. I'm going to shout. Please don't think Do I'm it. aggressive. <laughs> um, what I was saying, Bill, is that your inspiration for that particular um, concept, if you like, very much came from traveling to the area and seeing it for yourself and knowing the area. But what you were saying earlier was that many of these conversations um, that we're having, like client um, pitches, client conversations, can be done now um, via Zoom and via technology. Do you feel as if that may limit the creativity element of it? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, for example, um, next new project, uh, for example, uh, that we've, we've taken on since uh, four months now, since COVID started. It's a, a new project in Antigua. Yeah. Now, I've met, while I've done projects in St. Kitts and, and Nevis, I've never been to Antigua. But the, the project is going flying ahead beautifully. Um, and <clears throat> the clients send us, uh, send us Zoom overs, flyovers. They send us lots and lots of pictures. We get all the, the tree reports 
about what trees are on site. We get uh, a surveys of the, of, the, of the site itself. We make three-dimensional models of that site. Um, so we, we overcompensate for not actually having been on site. Um, it's an interesting, interesting project. If you got a minute, I'll tell you about it. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think that, um, well, I, for me personally, I've got a real relationship with, with the Caribbean and Nevis, as you said, I used to um, do the PR for Nevis. So I know Nevis and St. Kitts very well, but as you're saying, each island certainly has its own um, personality. But I think it's also interesting that you're saying that um, absolutely, it's all about research and that research doesn't have to be um, in person all the time. Um, so tell me about this project in Antigua. What we're doing there is we're doing 60, um, 60 individual bungalows. Each one of those bungalows are completely different because I don't want to build a hotel, I want to build a village. And each, each of the bungalows has its own vegetable garden. It has its own barbecue, it has its own swimming pool, it has its own front gate, it has its own beach gate. It, each, each bungalow has something like uh, 2,000 square meters of garden, private garden. And I think that's what the people, that's what travelers in the future are looking for, is this isolated world in which they can occupy um, on, a, on a very high, you know, it's a very high end $3,000 a night sort of product. Um, but the key is, and what, the, what everyone I think is going to, to really like about the project is that all 60 bungalows, they celebrate a personality, a local personality, a black personality primarily from Antigua. So instead of celebrating Sir Lord Nelson, uh, we are, uh, we're celebrating, you know, the, the, you know, their Olympian stars, their track and field stars, their, their teachers, their uh, people that you know, create um, cooking shows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, we're celebrating their local heroes. And the community has been fantastic in that, you know, we're getting all sorts of memorabilia or all sorts of personal collections uh, from, the, uh, from these various, uh, from these various heroes in order to be able to really celebrate them in a, in a correct manner. What do you think? Well, it, it sounds incredible. Absolutely incredible. And what, what I find interesting is that you're, you're known as, whether you like it or not, you're known as the sustainability king in, in design. All of your projects very much have that at its core, but actually it's not just about sustainability. It's also around the story, the narrative behind the project. And, you know, with each project, whether it's um, really sort of, um, championing that sustainability label. Um, it's all around the narrative, and I think that, that, that it sounds incredible. How long is that going to take you? Um, well, you do we're that finished with working drawings by the end of the year. By so the we're going to, yeah, end of the year, it's, uh, our, our drawings. So we're going to, it will take about two years in order to build this, 18 months, two years. So probably this time, two plus two years, uh, you'll be able to stay there. Do you ever get developers look at a plan that you're, you're pitching and just go, really, can you actually do this? Um, I want to make a nod to one of your projects that's coming up, which is the Human Zoo. I'm sure our um, audience have read all about it. If you haven't, we, we published a story about Bill Bensley's Human Zoo. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but the concept is that the humans are locked up in cages, luxury cages. Um, it's catered to the luxury market. No, it's not. No. No. What, what is it then? No. Uh, and it, the wildlife it, roams free beneath. Uh, it, that part's right. Yeah, yeah, but the humans are not locked up in ca they cages. Got a bit sensational with the headline. So yeah, no, the that's, yeah that, that's a bit silly. We're not going to lock anyone up in cages, but but. In essence, it's, it's turning the... Um, well, 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 just before you start, Bill, when I say cages, I do mean rooms, but it's, oh, yeah, okay. it's flipping it on its head so that the humans are behind a glass, if you like, and the animals are roaming free. That, that's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> uh, in I a think there should be cages. <laughs> a long story short, 
Um, uh, about four years ago, my client came to me, a good client of mine, and said, Mr. Bill, can you design a zoo? And I said, oh, shit, I hate zoos. Then I thought, um, well, what can we do to make, uh, uh, make something, make a zoo um, palatable to me? So I went to look at all the zoos all across, uh, 17 zoos all across, mo most of them, across uh, China. And you can imagine what I saw, some pretty bleak, uh, uh, bleak zoos, some horrible zoos. Mm. Um, and we've got this huge piece of land, something like two, two, uh, 2.9, uh, 2,900 uh, hectares of land, huge piece of land. Uh, and so I said to my client, what if we did this? What if we took 90% of the, of the land and let the animals be there uh, and with the idea that we only, we're only, how to say, celebrating, we're only bringing to the site undulates or hooked animals. The key is that there's no carnivores, there's no predators. Um, and, and because you can have a, a fantastic uh, viewing, like in Serengeti Plains, of, of, of large herds of animals. And so they said yes. Then the next step was, well, how do we make money with that? So we're, we're doing 2,200 rooms, which surround this part, much of this park, but it's all single loaded corridors. And the key here is that every one of those rooms or cages, as, as you call it, has a sleeping porch, has a sleeping porch and a porch inside uh, and, a, and a bedroom inside so that you can come out in, underneath the mosquito net and listen to the animals. Uh, all night long, if you like to. And we have uh, lighting and moonlighting and salt licks and, and watering holes right around the periphery so that the, the undulates will come closer to the hotels. Sounds what do you think? So ambitious and, and crazy, but actually it all just links very well. And actually it's very much just the conversations we're having already about you know how to challenge convention but also um, really think about sustainable solutions moving forward. And I love the fact that it's um, combining hospitality with wildlife, um, a theme that we're going to look through later on in, in the session as well, in one of the other sessions. You have well, so many is... projects on the board at any one time. How do you dedicate time to each of them? Um, I flip a coin. <laughs> go, go, go back to, the, go back to the, the human zoo, if you will. Uh, in Zhangjiang, that's where we're doing it, is that, and so at any one time, um, how to say, I'm doing this project strictly because it's something in this way, strictly because it's a selfish way of doing things. I, I'm doing this thing specifically because I own a property in Cambodia. It's called mm -hmm. Chintamani Wild, and we've adopted the southern, the southern portion of the Cardamom National Forest by way of 15 very high-end tents. The, the, Southern, the Cardamom Forest, National Forest in Cambodia is under great threat, huge threats every single day of wildlife poaching and illegal logging. The poaching of this dead wild animal meat goes to the, the tables of the rich and famous in Vietnam and in China, although it's illegal now, it's still happening today. So I thought to myself, when the clients came to me and says, Mr. Bill, can you build a zoo? I thought to myself, how can this benefit me? Yes, so, of course. Um, so I, I, I pitched the idea of, of this, of this uh, wildlife reserve, if you will, because, and there's also, I didn't mention, there's a train that wrap, wraps all the way around this. So we have the ability now as a planning to educate tens of millions of young Chinese in that perhaps wildlife should not be on our dinner plates. And, and that I think is the most exciting thing about the project. Is and, and why do you think now it's, it's being accepted as a, as a concept and it wasn't maybe five years ago? Because nothing's changed really. Poaching is still an issue as, as much an issue as it was back then. But what is it that's changed in people's minds to see the value and benefit of, of having a concept like this? Well, the, 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 cons, the, the value is that everybody, the, the, the 
consumption of wildlife is affecting every single person in the world now. And by way of COVID, COVID came from the COVID came from the wildlife. And we know now that I've tested on our property in Cardamon National Forest, the civet cats. They are being exported to Vietnam and so forth, but they also are holding their own type of COVID, which could re-release a whole new um, a whole new sickness amongst people. So it's more, more important now for the, for the world to understand the, that wildlife should not be eaten more so than ever before. And that, so that answers your question, eh? Yeah, totally. And do you think that that's the lesson of lockdown and, and us changing our, um, the way in which we're behaving now? Do you think that's a lesson to really, you know, put sustainability and wildlife and others and, and really sort of take a step back and exhale from the rush of life that we, that we were so used to? I mean, we're filming from London today and although things are starting to go back to normal, um, you know, this office block is, is completely empty. Um, do you feel as if people are going to put more emphasis in, in the well-being, not just on themselves, but in wildlife as well? The, the, um, the feedback that I get uh, almost on a daily basis is yes, 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 yes. We want to understand what we need to do. We want to understand you know, how we want to build something, we want to, but we want to understand how to build more sustainably. Uh, and we want to understand you know, everything that you know, what makes, what makes you, what makes me uh, tick? So yes, there's been yeah. There's a need for it now. And also with all of this, I mean, you, you're you're a man about detail. It's it's very very apparent. But how how much easier is your role now um, in leading this sustainable sustainability wave now that suppliers are more sort of on board when they're manufacturing products? Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, in fact, today I was just. Just, just right before this uh, webinar started, I was upstairs and we were doing a project, a new Shintamani in, in, uh, in China. And the, the amount of, of materials now that we can populate a hotel room with that are made from sustainable materials, uh, recyclable materials is fantastic. Um, and I, I learned something just recently last week that when we are, it's important for us as designers to remember that when we're designing something, uh, it's important if we're designing a chair or a table or whatever, that to try to create a product that has one material. So if I'm designing a, if I'm designing a coaster, I maybe make it out of 100% copper as opposed to, as, instead of five or six different types of, of, of materials because that is much easier to recycle than a multitude of, 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 of materials like might be in one of your, would you call it sleep easy beds? <laughs> <laughs> a mattress is, is one of the great examples of, of a yeah. very complex thing that has metals and plastics and wool and fiber. And, and that's, those are the things that, um, need to be looked at very carefully to, to go back to one material or, or less material so that it's easier to recycle. So a, a lot of um, designs on, on this in the audience will be thinking this is all very well and good. Um, you know, we can have all the best will in the world, but at the end of the day, it's the developer or the owner and the client that signs off the project. What advice would you give to designers trying to pitch a sustainable option um, to their developers or owners? A really good question. Um, look up my Instagram, uh, Bill Bensley. On that Instagram, you can, you can download a, my white paper. That white paper is, is 20 pages, it's illustrated, and it's free for your use. You can take, you know, it has nothing to do with my name, but read it. Um, and, but the, the takeaway to answer your question directly is that if you can tell a developer that an, about an idea, a sensible idea, and I think sustainability is overused, so I think it's about common sense. My paper is called 
sensible, sustainable solutions. Um, if you can tell a developer an idea that will save him money, that will make him money at the end of the day, then you don't even have to mention the idea of sustainability because to most people, as you say, sustainability means extra cost. Mm. So go around it. Say, I've got an idea that's going to save you money. This is how to do it. Download my paper and there's a plethora of ideas. Yeah, it's great. We, we published it when you first, oh. um, when you first published it yourself. So yeah, yeah. Actually, that's over on the Hotel of Science website as well. Um, do you think sustainability is a buzzword that needs to not be used anymore then? And actually more sort of, like there, there are alternatives like being more conscious as a designer that sort of takes away that stigma. Do you, do you agree with that? Um, I totally, totally. I think it, um, it, it's a word that's overused uh, and should be not. And what was interesting for me is that a few years ago at the Independent Hotel Show, um, they unveiled the Conscious Bedroom um, and they actually did a whole report, the Conscious Bedroom Report. Um, Alex Harris, who we, we heard from earlier from Harris and Harris, he actually designed that and it got so much attention and, um, and engagement. And I think the reason being is because they didn't just focus on sustainability, they focused about being conscious as um, a hotelier and, and little things like not necessarily in the design, but you know, there was uh, um, an egg timer in the, in the shower, which is very simple, but, but concepts Ooh. like that. Wow. However, a lot of designers can do sustainability badly. What pitfalls have you seen in your career? I'm sure there are many that you've seen, maybe not name and shame, but what are the major pitfalls that designers should avoid when they're trying to um, ensure that their project is, is a sustainable one? I, I, don't, I know of no pitfalls. I, I think that at this point in our, in, um, in the history of the world, anybody who's trying to do anything which is anywhere near green is all good. So, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I, I think that uh, greenwashing should be a mandatory five-year jail sentence for anyone in any country around the world, but anyone who's honestly trying to do something that's sustainable or something that's that will benefit the world and reverse its destruction is great. Greenwashing is challenging. And I think that everyone out there has experienced a hotelier or a hotel greenwashing. Um, mine was that a particular, I don't want to name and shame because that would be inappropriate, but um, I well, checked into a hotel room and everything that I could see was wrapped in plastic. Everything, <laughs> even the, the cutlery spoon, um, the mugs, everything. And it was a, a hotel brand that was um, trying to be the most sustainable hotel um, in a very well-known city, um, but obviously with a particular product. So that was great PR and the value of PR um, is you know, immeasurable. But how do we tackle greenwashing? Is it a case of name and shaming, which I won't even do? How, how do we tackle that? Well, you should name and shame. Yeah, what? maybe. <laughs> Who was it? I can't say. You can't say. They're my sponsor. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Especially with, um, with the way in which the world is. We have to be PC. We have to be correct. There's certain um, powers from certain, certain brands and certain chains. But I will also say that there are certain chains doing some amazing things. And maybe the solution is to really champion them um, from a PR perspective. And, and that's actually... You know, we have very much tried to put sustainability right on the agenda all the time at Hotel Designs, and we will massively steer our hotel reviews to the ones that are sustainable and the ones that have, you know, just an interesting narrative. When I was on um, at that same show, the Independent Hotel Show, we were on stage and doing a panel discussion, and I could see everyone writing notes about everything that was said. And I kind of just addressed the audience and said, well, it's all very well you writing notes, but what works for this hotel won't work for others. So it's kind of a difficult topic to put under the spotlight sustainability because isn't it individual and personal to everyone? Um, let's take that back to plastics. 
Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I, I, I wanted, want to say I own four hotels, four hotels that are all Shintamani's. And about five years ago, we decided to be plastic free, 100% plastic free, which meant that we put in a bottling plant and we put in a bottling plant, $20,000, $25,000. It's paid back itself in two years time. Um, we have a, a series of, uh, not only front of house is plastic free, but also our back of house is plastic free. And our, my, um, how to say, my, my uh, modus operandi is that we don't have any waste at all. So, but one of the key things I want to share with you is that I bought a whole series of big igloo, igloo coolers, big ones. And the blue ones are for, for fish and the green ones are for vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. And we have two sets of these. And the, these goes to our suppliers. They put the, the, uh, our product in those, in those without plastics and so forth. And then we keep re re replacing them. The other old way that we used to do it and the way 95% plus plus of the things get shipped in in plastic bags and in pl bigger, bigger plastic bag and bigger plastic. And then all of that stuff gets thrown in the trash. So it's really simple ideas, which I think, what I think are sensible, just, yeah. just sensible solutions that can, that if, in, if every hotel, half of the hotels were at least to take that simple idea of two sets of igloo, igloo uh, containers that go back and forth between suppliers and hotels, we, that would reduce a whole lot of plastics. What do you think? Yeah, I, I just think any, any ideas outside the box are, are the ones that, um, <laughs> that, that will <laughs> carry the most weight, personally. I think you know, it's all very well following the fashion. And of course, you know, everyone should be plastic free. But what I really want to do when I discuss sustainability, and I find it difficult to discuss sustainability because it, there's so much stigma behind it for some reason, but to really try not to focus on yesterday or today and to think ahead and into the future i think that's maybe why it's so difficult because we can't necessarily predict the future but um designers like yourself certainly have um wacky and wonderful ideas of what hospitality could be and can be do you find that you um because you you've owned hotels and you own hotels that you kind of have um a leg up over some other designers in regards to like getting these concepts through and built and you know you can then share them on, on your network and to your followers that you've created over the year right it makes uh because being a hotel owner we can do what the hell we want to do uh but yeah we can, we can also prove then by way of example to um to other hotel companies and so forth that yes it can be done you know don't give me that crap that it, you know we can't be plastic free until 2022, da, 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 which is BS, right? You can be, yeah, it, totally. it, once, once we decided to do it, it took us something like two months to clear the shelves, right? Yeah, so, totally. you know, you don't have to plan to be plastic free that far ahead of time. So, um, I'm really intrigued with your project in Jakarta and how, like the concept right through to completion, um, how you're going to design a completely recyclable hotel. Aside from the obvious, which is to source the materials, what do you think is going to be the, the second most challenging um, scenario that you're going to face doing that? I think that the most difficult thing for us to do is not the front of house. And I think that's going to be, the, it's going to be um, the infrastructure. How, how are we gonna, how, how are we gonna, I'm, I'm not sure how to get my head around that yet. How do we put down the, the cables and so forth, the, you know, the, the, you know, the sewage and the electricity and so forth. And how, how can we actually do that by way of recycling from other, other projects? Hmm. So that, that part's difficult. But it's um, interesting, isn't it? Because I also think recently, in, well, in recent years, there's um, designers are, are more willing to collaborate with specialists and they're actually seeing that actually 
that obviously values the overall um, hotel or, or concept because you can't be a jack of all trades. For example, with lighting, you know, you would work with a lighting consultant and what have you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that's changed? And do you think that that's going to help hospitality moving forward? Everyone's more, everyone's ability to, to collaborate. And actually, do you think COVID-19 and, and what's happening recently is going to um, really steer people to want to collaborate more with others? I think, I, I, as I said a little bit earlier, I think since the, the silver lining of COVID is that we're, I'm collaborating, I'm talking more to more people than I ever have in my entire life. So an exchange of ideas is happening quicker. And uh, I do things like this almost on a daily basis. And listen to It's interesting to me because a lot of, I, well, I've heard from a lot of designers and they feel as if sustainability has creeped off the agenda, but it's, it's nice positive um, spin to hear that perhaps it hasn't. Yeah. Um, sustainability too can mean um, not just the materials in which we use, but it can also be the people that we're working with within hospitality. Uh, for example, uh, the Shintamani Wild, a project in, in the Vietnam or in uh, Cambodia, uh, is, is located right next to a little tiny village uh, of maybe 800 people in, in a place called Tamorum, beautiful little place. And this, this village for, for many, many years, has been established as a, as a hunter's village in order to, to hunt the animals within the park and to, and to log. So that's how they were established. But when we came along, we employed 75% of our employees are from that village. So many of them are the, the poachers that have now become rangers and so forth. So I think that, to me, is a great example of sustainability, a long-term uh, reorganization of their lives and to live a better life and much, much softer life, if you will, and a win-win situation. So that, to me, is real sustainability. Yeah. Wow, so inspiring. I think that there's, there's so much that we, we can learn through the concepts that you are putting out on the boards daily, it seems. <laughs> so other than the completely recyclable hotel and the um, hotel in Antigua and the human zoo that you're working on, are there other projects that you are working on that you think are gonna really sort of take um, sustainability to, to another level? Um, I am, <laughs> I, this is a really, really good one. It's not, um, how to say, uh, um, as headline worthy as the human zoo, but one thing, one, one uh, project that I'm really enjo enjoying, actually there's two, uh, but there's one in Sri Lanka and it's in a place uh, north of Canby. Um, and it's, it, it is a, something like a 400 hectare uh, rice, no, spice farm. And, and they are growing and exporting vanilla, clove, you name it, they, 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 they're exporting. So and they came to me and says, well, we want to take, they, they do really well financially, but we want to take um, our, our farm to the next level. So I'm designing something like 12 little bungalows uh, in, in each one of the parts of the farm. Like, I've got, I got, I got something called the Vanilla Villa. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be a bit of a theme there with your, with your bungalows. Do you see that that's the way things are going as opposed to, you know, these public areas in our next session um, yes. that, that goes live at 11 o'clock? We're very much looking at adding personality in public areas. But do you feel as if what's happened recently that will eliminate the need for public areas so much? Right before this conversation, I was on the phone with uh, a group from Amenabad, and I had been talking to them since um, early this year, pre-COVID, and they came back to us and said, look, Bill, there's this huge demand for private bungalows, but we're going to cancel, we're going to cancel the clubhouse. So right. let's, let's get on with it. Let's go for it. But, but no one wants to go to this clubhouse anymore. No one wants to have lobbies anymore. No one wants to 
Everyone but it's wants... tricky because some would also argue that it's too soon to predict the future. And um, we don't have the answers at the moment. So to eliminate public areas could be quite damaging. What do you think about that? But the key is don't build it um, if, if there's no demand for it now. But if it, if it does come back, then you can build it. Yeah, of course. Right? And I've got another question for you, Bill, which is um, a lot of your projects seem to grab the headlines, um, which is obviously, um, you know, absolutely uh, goes into the concept as to why you've created and designed it. Um, do you feel as if this is the only way for you to put sustainability on the map to the masses, is to create that PR machine around your products? Well, I, I, I how to say, I've been very, um, very fortunate that people are interested in what we do and we get, um, but it's, how to say, I create these projects the way we do, because I think it's in, in my, it's from my heart, it's the right thing to do. It's the right, the right way to go. I was trained as a landscape architect and to, to create projects and in, in, in projects that are great sensitive, ecologically sensitive. I do so with a minimal impact. Um, yeah. But I, I think it's, it's about serving my client first in the best way possible. And if, and if, you know, if that makes headlines, great, you know, that that's only going to benefit him or her. Uh, but it's not something that I start with a headline and then, and then follow on with the project. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's very obvious that you don't just create the projects for a headline. Um, but it is, it is a, a part of it. And it is when, when you think about the reason why um, you're creating and sustainability is so, you know, part of your life is because you want to really educate the masses on why mm -hmm. we should be thinking about sustainability and creating a sustainable future within this industry, but also the way we live as well. So I think it's, I don't know, maybe dancing with the devil. You really do have to create those headlines in order to get the exposure. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind dancing with the devil. <laughs> I wanted... and, you know, sustainability has become become your niche. Do you do you feel like designers finding their niche can do so sustainably? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I want I want to tell you um, a, about it, a, a fourth project uh, that we we finished last year. And my client came to me and said, uh, "Mr. Bill, we've got this." Um, Accor, Accor Hotel, 120 rooms. We're going to build it, you know, 30 square meter rooms. We're going to build 120 of them and put it down this valley in Ubud, in Bali. Beautiful, beautiful site. And I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, fast forward six months, uh, I convinced the client to, to build just 22 tents that tiptoe in this forest, little tiny little tiny uh, footprints that fit between the trees. Um, the 120 room hotel would have obliterated something like 450 trees. Uh, but as we turned out, we didn't cut down one tree. Um, the end of, at the end of the day, just before COVID, um, we built that project for one third of the initial cost. Uh, we are now, uh, $850 per night, mm -hmm. highest room rate in Bali. And last month we won Travel and Leisure, number one hotel in the world. Amazing. Uh, and that's what I call doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it also really eliminates that preconception that sustainability is going to cost money and what? not add to the overall business structure of what that hotel is trying to achieve as well. That's what it's all about. If you can figure out a way to tell your clients, to tell the developer it's going to cost less money and you're going to make more money, then this is the way to open the door. Totally, yeah. So Bill, I want to do a quick fire round with you. We do this with our Q and A's. Um, so what's been your favorite year 
in the industry so far and why? This year, I love COVID year. Yeah, yeah. But nobody other than you. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. Maybe you're right, there's opportunities. And also this industry is full of creative, solution-driven people. So if anyone can make COVID a positive, it's the designers, architects, and hoteliers that are hopefully tuned in in the audience and yourself. It's been, it's been really difficult for us as far as, um, you know, keeping the doors open on, our, on the few hotels that we have, but um, we may do. We've become the, the darling of the, of the rich and famous set and, and local people in Cambodia, and they've kept our doors open. So, you know, yeah. I'm down. And what lessons would you, well, what lesson would you teach your younger self if you could? <laughs> Any regrets? <laughs> Any the lessons I would teach my younger self? Good, good question. We really? can come back to it. Okay, let's come back to that. I think that's a really, I need to think about that. That's a well, really the good next one is what number one luxury item could you not live without? Which is interesting because my dog. This, oh, my dog. Oh, he's the best luxury. And I've got six Jack Russell. That's a very cool luxury item. <laughs> and see, this, this is a luxury item, but it's um. He also has a Victoria cone because he's got a little <laughs> little thing on his leg here, so I kept oh, it. Okay. But I've got six Jack Russells, so that's wow. my luxury item. It's that's interesting, isn't it? There's sustainability and luxury isn't used very much in the same sentence. I think it is more so now or is becoming that way. Um, but it's a complete misconception because you can have a luxury hotel and it be sustainable. Look at all the award winning hotels that are out there. Right. Yeah, and all of your hotels very much cater on the luxury scene as well. Um, Bill, we, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I just want to apologize for the technical glitches we had earlier. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our product watch pitch as well. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, just to let everyone know, we will be back um, at 11 o'clock, half an hour from now, where we will be discussing uh, adding personality in the public areas. And this follows on from the conversations we had in the first Hotel Designs Live, which was, will public areas ever be the same again? So we've established that they will, they're safe and secure spaces, um, and we're looking at personality. But with what Bill just said in regards to whether public areas are strictly necessary, that will be an interesting conversation to put to our panelists there. Join us at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much, Bill. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.